So let's first start by talking about how we can prepare ethers. Okay, so there are several ways to do this. Um, and I think that uh, actually probably almost all of this is going to be review in a certain sense, um, things that you dealt with uh, last semester when you talked about alkyl halides um, and to a certain degree when we talked about alcohols. All right, so there won't be a lot that's new under the sun, but um, I think it's worthwhile that we uh, discuss this um, in detail just at the moment. So in terms of preparation, um, you can do a substitution chemistry that you've already learned. So um, for example, uh, SN1 uh, strategies to make ethers are, are certainly um, one way to think about uh, forming these molecules. So if you have an alkyl halide that's going to be prone to carbocation formation, um, so something like a, you know, a tertiary alkyl chloride um, that has the, the capabilities to, to ionize, that can certainly be trapped by an alcohol uh, to give um, an, an ether, um, but that's obviously limiting in terms of the, the one component has to be uh, something that could give rise to a stable carbocation. So SN1 has its place, um, but uh, certainly we would like a little bit um, more generality in what we can form. And so SN2 strategies turn out to be uh, very useful as well. And here um, the um, the most common uh, approach to uh, ethers in this way is uh, something that's called the Williamson ether synthesis. Ether synthesis, okay, synthesis. Um, and this was something that was actually um, first described in 1850, um, so before the Civil War. Um, and it turns out that this is still the state of the art for how to form ethers. So not a lot has changed in that time. Um, and basically, this is something we've already talked about. Um, what you're going to do in the Williamson ether synthesis is to take an alcohol and you're going to convert it to its alkoxide. So we're going to need a strong base. Now, one of the common one uh, bases to use is sodium hydride, um, but you could use anything, anything that's sufficient to uh, pull off that proton, uh, green yard or uh, alkyl lithium or what have you. Um, but you're going to stoichiometrically form the alkoxide ion and then you're going to throw in um, your alkylating piece that uh, is is prone to do SN2 chemistry. So you know your primary um, electrophiles are going to be great, um, and sometimes you can get away with secondary electrophiles if they're not too hindered. Um, but even there, things start to get a little complicated. Um, but at any rate, you throw in your alkylating agent, and you will then. Uh, do an SN2 of the alkoxide to the iodide in this case, and you form your ether, right? So that works out pretty well. Um, and of course, instead of the iodide, we could also use um, an alkyl bromide, um, or we could even use, um, in many cases, the, the tosylate. So we could convert an alcohol to the tosylate. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, um, they're going to be less reactive, but you can oftentimes use alkyl chlorides as well. Okay, so any of those, um, as long as it uh, is capable of participating in an SN2 reaction, um, any of those uh, can certainly be used. Okay, and the mechanism, I think, is, is very straightforward. Now, there's one um, important point here is that um, you, you always want to pick, if you have an unsymmetrical ether that you're forming in this way, um, you always want to use the most hindered um, piece of your of your eventual ether as the alkoxide piece. So most hindered, um, we'll just call it piece, um, as the alkoxide, okay? So for example, um, if I wanted to make, let's just go back and use our, our terbutyl. Uh, let's say we wanted to make ter MTBE, right? Uh, methyl terbutyl ether, okay? Uh, the way that we would want to do this is to uh, take our terbutanol and deprotonate that piece. Okay, so we get to sodium terbutoxide and then uh, alkylate that with methyl iodide. Okay, so there we get to our MTBE. That's the way to do that. What we would not want to attempt to do is to take the methanol and deprotonate that. So the deprotonation would work fine. We would get to our sodium methoxide, okay, plus, 
Um, but now if we try to throw in, uh, you know, the electric electrophilic uh, terp butyl iodide, um, that's just not going to work, right? That's, that's not going to give us any of the ether in that case. Um, and the reason is because um, this, you know, a, a tertiary iodide isn't prone to um, do SN2 chemistry. It's just not going to work, right? So instead, what you would find from uh, that reaction, right? again, thinking back to last semester, is instead of doing an SN2, uh, you're likely to do an E2. So there's our terpetyl iodide, and we would instead expect to see an elimination of this type. So we would get out isobutylene in this case, um, along with just our, our protonated alcohol. And then, um, you know, if we had our sodium cation, we would have sodium iodide, right? So that's the product that we would expect from the second case. So that's not going to be appropriate for either formation. Um, but the first case is, is the way you want to do it. Okay. Um, incidentally, um, the Williamson ether formation also works quite well um, if we want to make aromatic ethers. Okay. So I think we discussed this briefly. Um, but if we take a phenol, phenols are more acidic than aliphatic alcohols. So these are going to be um, even easier to deprotonate, okay? And so we can form our, in this case, sodium phenoxide, okay? Um, and then we can throw in, you know, whatever uh, alkylating agent we want. Maybe we'll throw in butyl iodide there, um, and then we can alkylate that phenolic oxygen, okay? So, and butyl. There we go. All right, so that's that's a, a completely sufficient way to make um, aryl ethers as well. Okay, um, there is a final one um, that I want to mention. So um, if you remember back um, uh, in the discussion of how to make alcohols from alkenes, we talked about um, oxymercuration. Um, and that was where we used a mercury-2 salt um, in water uh, to basically add um, the water molecule across the, the alkene. Um, it turns out we can do the exact same chemistry if uh, we just do it in an alcohol. So whatever ether we want to make, we'll do it in that alcohol, okay? And so instead of water trapping that intermediate, we'll just get the, um, the uh, alcohol to trap, right? So the reagent we're going to use here is mercury trifluoroacetate, okay? So there is our reagent, so mercury uh, trifluoroacetate, and then we're going to do it in whatever alcohol we want to trap, and this will this will go to give an initial intermediate uh, where we um, sorry we have added uh, the ether right or that alcohol across the olefin, and then we have our mercury attached, um, and so this has. ligands on the mercury okay so that's our intermediate and then uh, just like we did in the oxymercuration we're going to reduce off the mercury with sodium borohydride okay so just sodium borohydride reduction and then that will give us our ether okay? where we've added the alcohol across the olefin in a overall Markovnikov fashion okay um, and this actually just turns out to be uh, the same as if it was an acid catalyzed um, ether formation on an alkene, um, but it turns out to be a lot milder um, of a reaction um, as opposed to treating uh, an alkene with strong acid. Um, we can do the oxymercuration. The mercuration has its drawbacks because mercury is toxic, um, but it is milder in terms of, um, and as far as the um, molecule is concerned. Okay, so that's how we can prepare ethers there's not a lot that's new there, um, perhaps just this uh, slight difference in terms of the oxymercuration. Um, and now, what about the chemistry of ethers? Well, as I hinted to in the last video, the chemistry of ethers is relatively limited, um, so they, they are uh, somewhat basic. Okay, So we um, already talked about how an ether can pick up a proton, okay? and so we can certainly access intermediates of this type. Okay. 
Um, so that's that's a Bronsted basicity, um, right? So reacting with protons. Um, they are also Lewis basic. So if we have um, a Lewis acid, and let's just uh, say let's just say we have BF three boron trifluoride, which is a pretty good Lewis acid. We can also see uh, Lewis um, basic activity from the ether. So we'll coordinate a Lewis acid to the ether. So that's also possible. Um, but there's no Oh, there's no uh, simple um, chemistry analogous to the other things that alcohols can do. So you, you, you're not going to deprotonate an ether, at least not in the way that we saw before. Um, you're not going to do oxidations, at least not in the way that we saw before. And so a lot of the chemistry of ethers is, is sort of just um, not, not there, right? Um, and so we don't actually have a lot to talk about here. Um, but the one thing that I uh, will point out is that there are um, cleavage reactions of ethers, right? So where we actually break the ether um, back apart into oftentimes an alcohol and, um, uh, well, uh, oftentimes a, uh, an alcohol halide is the other piece. So it's sort of a reverse Williamson. Um, and this has its use, I think, in, uh, in sometimes ethers are used as protecting groups for alcohols, not often because they're almost too stable. Um, but sometimes, and uh, certainly in the case of when we talked about uh, polymerization of tetrahydrofuran, um, that's a case where an ether is undergoing chemistry and being broken back apart. So uh, these cleavage reactions do have their place. Um, and I want to show you just uh, generically what uh, can happen here. So let's just envision that uh, we have, uh, let's just say some ethyl ether, so some piece in, a, in an ethyl ether. Um, and what can happen is if you treat this with um, a strong enough acid, so let's just say um, HI, um, what can happen here is that the, uh, the um, ether can be uh, basically broken back apart um, into its constituent alcohol and iodide. And so the way that this would work is, right, so we've got a, a strong enough acid to protonate the alcohol, right? So we will actually get to our oxonium, okay? And this is something that we've been, we've been seeing, um, you know, to a fair extent. And now we've got uh, I minus, and uh, what can happen here is that um, this highly nucleophilic iodide can actually kick off the, the alcohol portion. So we get ROH um, and then and then we will get to our alkyl iodide. So it's it's a fairly straightforward um, type of reaction, um, and you know this requires um, a very strong acid and a and a very nucleophilic um, iodide or or other other types of nucleophiles will work as well, but they have to be very nucleophilic and they also have to be compatible with a strong acid, right? So um, this is not going to work with very many things, but HI would be one. Um, or if you were to treat, um, you know, with a weaker acid, but really heat it up very high, you could probably get this to go as well. Um, it's not a very nice reaction, but it, it can be a, um, something that happens. Um, and uh, I will just show you one, one last one, um, just because it is somewhat um, common. And then, so I think we can put this into our, um, our repertoire. So uh, if we have an, an aryl ether, let's say it's a, a methyl ether, so anisole in this case, um, we can uh, we can remove that methyl group um, by basically treating this with a strong Lewis acid. So boron tribromide would be uh, a case. So this is a very uh, potent reagent, and you would want to be careful of what kind of molecules you throw this at. Um, but uh, in the case of anisole, this would probably work okay. And what we'll get out at the end of the day is again a breaking apart of that ether into its constituent components. And the way that this works is very analogous to the um, reaction with HI. So here we're gonna have um, boron tribromide, and that's gonna do a Lewis acid, Lewis base um, type of interaction. And so we can uh, have the ether displace a bromide um, on the boron. And when we do that, uh, what we'll have then is that ether coordinated by the boron. So that makes that an oxonium, right? So now, in this case, we just spit off a Br minus, Br minus, which can then do a displacement like that, okay? 
And so we just ripped off that methyl group and we'll get a boron dibromide on the oxygen. Uh, there's our, our methyl halide, our, uh, yeah, our uh, methyl bromide. And then here, uh, we're just going to treat this with a, you know, an H up plus workup uh, to remove the boron, right? So we don't, we don't have to worry about the mechanism of that last part. Um, but it's the same type of thing. You're coordinating to the oxygen with a very strong Lewis acid. So Bronsted acid or Lewis acid, whatever it's going to be, it has to be something strong enough to form this complex and, and keep it around long enough that this counter ion can then come in and knock off um, one of those substituents on the ether uh, to get to this point. Okay, so they're both related, whether it's HI or BBR3. Um, again, you wouldn't want to do this with sensitive molecules, but it can work in some cases. All right, in the next video, we're going to talk about a very special class of ethers known as epoxides.